My name's Hugh Datz, and I've been with Duscan for quite a while. And I'd like to apologise on behalf of my colleague, Oliver Puddle, who can't be here because he's doing a site assessment for one area of uh, quarry dust, and that's RCS. And that's, that's a topic I'll very briefly touch on at the end. Um, instead, I've brought a colleague, uh, another colleague, uh, Dan Quinn, um, and uh, our stand is along there. And uh, thank you very much for having a look at it um, when you have. And on the stand, you will see Percy Particle. Now, Percy Particle is here. Sorry, sorry about this. This is, this is a sales pitch deli de in, de um, developed indeed by Oliver, so I, no apologies from me. But the point being is that this is a spot prize. On our stand, we have the question that I will bring at the end, and I will find out if anyone has been paying attention, been to our stand, and knows the answer to the question. Um, because I'll, I'll show a picture, and it'll be an, um, of a material, and um, we'll, 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 we'll find out if anyone's being paying attention. Let's put it that way. Anyway, so, so firstly, MD, thank you very much. <coughs> Secondly, um, it was when I was when I, well when I was going through the the, uh, the program today. Um, I was well. I was very well. It was just the other day. Um, I was very pleased to see, um, and it, this was just out of the blue. Um, but uh, Rob Farnfield is on was on the uh, program list, and Rob um, was actually one of the co-developers of Duscan um, when he was at Leeds. So a big shout out to Rob. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much. Because it indeed is because of Rob's work with Bill Birch that we're here and we're doing this thing now. So thanks very much for that. Um, and then thirdly, um, what I was going to say was that you'll see on the, uh, on, on the uh, program uh, that I was going to be talking about mineral planning. Um, and that's because I and we are involved with um, another working group, the Institute of Air Quality Management, to develop new um, planning guidance for the, um, well, for the mineral sector. But the guidance isn't developed yet, and so we decided that it wasn't really time to, to, to bring it forward. Um, and then finally, uh, by way of introduction, um, I'll be talking about dust that's everything other than this health and safety area, um, which, I find, which I find very interesting. And indeed, um, it'll be, uh, it's, it's interesting to see the sort of the overlap and connections and what have you between, um, you know, uh, dust in the environment and dust in the workplace and what have you, because at the end of the day, it's the same stuff. It's the same, it's the, it's the same material. It affects things, us, differently. Um, and, uh, but it's the same material. And so, hence, the purpose of this talk instead is about innovation. Um, and the reason, again, about innovate, it, why we're talking about innovation is because that's where Duscan comes from. And indeed, it starts off with a bit of sticky back plastic. Um, but we do loads more stuff than that now. And we do loads more stuff than that now because... Um, we've, always, we, you know, we, we've often had a sort of a, uh, an inquiring attitude. We often have clients coming to us um, with problems who, and, and sort of not, you know, not being able to necessarily identify the, the solution. And indeed, we've then helped them um, work out a, a solution for them. So, and this is, this is familiar. This is, you know, this is what, this is the background to air quality and dust and so on. And this is why it is so important. Um, you know, the, the atmosphere, the air around us, we all share it. We all breathe it. Um, and, you know, although it's a little bit trite, we can survive without food for days and we can survive without water for hours, but we really cannot survive without air for very long at all. And it's important that we, that we, pay attention to the fact that air, you know, the quality of the air around us um, matters. Um, and the, 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 the issue around air quality, of course, is that it's a bit of a, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a silent issue. It's a, again, this was brought up this morning about how we won't necessarily see people suffering instantaneous effects from poor air quality, but we certainly know about it on a, on a long-term basis. We know that it reduces, you know, that, that poor air quality affects lifespan and therefore, um, you know, uh, and it affects us all as a consequence. So in terms of um, particular matter, dust, and the area that we work in, um, we have definitions for it. Um, and the, 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 certainly for convenience, um, we divide it. We can divide it into three areas. We can talk about um, the sort of the, 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 the workplace exposure um, and the public exposure to to dust. In other words, and and they are 
well-defined, they're categorised, they, they can be, um, you know, they, they can be uh, identified. Um, we may disagree about the, the, the instrumentation, perhaps, about how that's, 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 that's done, but we know um, that at least, that, you know, for example, very small particles will get in our lungs and will cause us harm over time. Hence, we can have um, air quality objectives for PM10, and we can have workplace exposure limits for um, inhalable dust or respirable dust and so on. Um, and these are very clearly defined, they're very easily um, understood, um, and they relate to particle size because of the fact that there is a dynamic system, and that is that you have suspended material in the air and it can be breathed in, and because it can be breathed in, it can do harm. But the area that we work in, or rather the area, the heritage for dust scan, is actually this other area, and it's this stuff. And it's a lot harder to, to, to um, uh, categorize because it's what we call nuisance dust. And of course, I mean, in, any, in fact, in any, any, any assessment I write, I tend to put nuisance in inverted commas because nuisance is actually something that's defined in, to, should be des, um, defined in terms of the um, Environmental Protection Act as opposed to um, what, you know, what we see. So, you know, in other words, we see this, we see this going on, we, we, we see it, it causes a nuisance, but, um, you know, it, 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 because, it, because it has this, so, this social and environmental impact as well. But clearly, it's the same stuff, it's just different, it, it's just a sort of a different category, different size fraction and so on. And here are some examples, surface mining and, and again, drilling and blasting, but also um, construction sites and, again, landfill. And, you know, we work in all of these, these, these areas. So this nuisance dust stuff, it's poorly defined. It's the stuff we can see, as opposed to, generally speaking, the stuff we can't see. Um, it's, 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 not very, it's not regulated. There are no official standards for it. But what you can say is that um, you'll see us, I mean, generally speaking, you can say, well, you see it instantaneously. You, you see a dust cloud and, and say, well, you know, look at that. That's, that's dust blowing around all over the place. Um, or you might say, and, and that then might lead on to an, an, an impact, um, you know, where, where then, you know, a surface becomes discoloured and soiled and, 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 and so on, and that becomes objectionable. Very difficult, therefore, um, to uh, develop limit values for those, because those, those um, effects rely very much on our own and our different response to those, those issues. Um, you know, some of us might be sort of very house proud, so as to speak, and um, others may, you know, may, may not be. Both are legitimate, uh, and so it's very difficult, therefore, to then come up with um, uh, measurements for those, um, you know, or, or sort of criteria for those, uh, those, 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 those events. So consequently, um, there aren't any limit values for, for nuisance dust. And um, essentially, and again, this is where um, the likes of Rob came in, because um, the, the, the methods that have, were used for monitoring or evaluating this stuff are what's called passive. They're unpowered. It's, um, um, you know, quite, quite frankly, um, simple equipment, um, you know, because... There's no point in, in investing a lot of time and money on instrumentation uh, for something that isn't necessarily well defined. And indeed, because it's difficult to define uh, what is nuisance dust, it's therefore um, very difficult to, and, and in fact, there's very little out there. But, and the point being is that, and we have taken this as far as forward as we can, or with, and we're always trying to work on it, is we've always seen this as an opportunity for innovation because, of course, um, where there is a where there is something that's readily readily defined, uh, it's it's of course therefore straightforward to measure it. You may use a different machine to measure it, but you'll you'll measure it. But nonetheless. Um, where something isn't defined, and yet there is a need to um, evaluate it in some way, that's where we've seen the opportunity. So here are some examples, and, and again, these are familiar. We see, a, we see you know, site processing, and we see a dust cloud, and, and this is from a public, you know, on a public highway, uh, where we see a dust cloud, and of course that might just be causing, that might be hazardous, you know, because that might indeed be stuff blowing across the road. I don't think it was in this particular case, but clearly it could be on, on occasions. But that leads to this sort of dinginess, as it's called, and the, the, the long-term soiling effect of, of, of dust, hence what to, what to, to measure. So, 
the instrumentation used has been, uh, as I say, unpowered. You can either measure how much it weighs or you can measure what it looks like some kind of optical effect of it. You can measure what drops out of the sky, or you can measure as it blows through the air. Unfortunately, and I'm afraid this is a mistake that often gets repeated and therefore compounded, where mass measurements and mass per area measurements are given, I, I'm afraid it is quite often done that people will then think that it is possible to, in, to, to interchange uh, mass units by, by flux and deposition. There isn't it isn't the case, and certainly isn't the case between different effect uh, measurements and mass and so on. But of course, it's a, therefore, it means it's a little bit difficult uh, because there are no limit values. And indeed, look, I, I work for a company that supplies this kit, but I would certainly say that our hours is not the only way to do this. Um, and there is not a single method as appropriate. There is not a single method applied. I'd love to have the opportunity to work on developing that, um, but it certainly isn't the case at the moment. But it does mean, and again, where we get the opportunity to say this, rather than saying, oh, well, here's a number in the guidance, let's pick that out, and let's say that's an, a limit value that should be applied, I am much more of a, a fan of saying, let's look for site-specific values, because, of course, they are those that will will be much more relevant to the operation and to the community in which it takes place. And they are much more likely, therefore, to be effective as a result. They'll be effective for the operator, the regulator, and for the community, which clearly is what we all, what we all want to strive for. So here's Duscan Heritage. I, Rob, I, I hope you'll recognize the, the instrument in the middle. There, there it is. It's, 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 you know, that... Bill supplied that photo for me for my thesis, and you know that it's 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 everything there. And the thing is, we've start we started off with the the uh, British standard direction of dust gauge, and as an, I mean, certainly as I understand it, well as I as I know for for that thing, look, it doesn't work. It is a British standard, but everyone said, well, it's a British standard, let's use it. But the fact of the matter is, it doesn't work. And so, Bill and Rob came up with this thing in the middle, which was a sticky cylinder which being aerodynamically much more simple, works a lot better than the, the thing on the left. And that has basically been developed by us to make it a bit more streamlined, a bit neater, and a bit, well, bit, bit better packaged, but the basic principle is still the same in that you have a sticky cylinder and you have, um, in fact, as on the, and the one in the middle, you've also got a, a sticky plate on the top, um, and, the, and the one on the left has got a sticky plate on the top. And indeed, as Steve reminded me this morning, we developed that, with, with the, the help of the likes of Steve Cole, because uh, we, 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 we found it was necessary to put bird spikes on there for the obvious reason, because uh, certainly on, on some sites, we do, you know, one finds that uh, birds will land on there and then make the samples pretty useless. But that's the heritage. That's where we've come from, and that's where we are now. Now, for me, the... The, 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 reason, the reason I'm standing here, the reason, I, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be standing here, because um, as a research scientist, I mean, I, you know, I, I started off in, in, in a different area, but I, in fact, I started off in farming, and that, that picture on the left there is a barn from the farm there, where I was able, through the, the, uh, in, the offices of Leeds University, to set up a wind tunnel at the farm at home, uh, where I was then able to, develop, to, to evaluate and test this equipment. And for anyone who does practical, practical science, practical engineering, what have you, it was, it was, for me, it was the best opportunity I'd had for a long time because it was a question of developing an experiment, a designing experiment, testing equipment, and so on. And it was all about making sure something worked. How do we find out something works? And it took about three years to get, it to, to get it to work. And the reason for doing that, though, was because in the early days of Duscan, people would say, well, look, we know the British standard gauge doesn't work, so how can you say that your gauge doesn't catch dust on the reverse? This experiment was set up partly to demonstrate that, no, you don't catch dust on the reverse because aerodynamically it's different. And that's what this, this equipment was, was, was designed for and, and indeed was then used... Um, to, well, basically, I, I then fired a load of dust into the barn, and I don't think my, my, my brother's ever forgiven me, but, you know, it was, it, it was a necessary thing. And there's some examples of the, uh, the, the, the work. Uh, it, it, the, the, the basic principle works through software, and you measure the difference between pixels with dust on and with, without dust on. The, you can then present it in a particular way. 
the experiments then look, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that the stuff worked, which is what it was about. And indeed, then again, again through Leeds University, then looked at um, particle size distribution grading um, of the dust caught on the cylinders so that we could then say something about the samples that were, the, the material we were the cat catching on the, on the samples, which hence leads on to this issue about innovation. Because once one has got a sample in a sort of a simple form, such as on a bit of sticky back plastic, you can then do quite a lot with it. And indeed, here are some examples. Uh, there's a false color element <coughs> map uh, of, of dust, you know, dust caught on a sample on the top left. Um, two pictures uh, on the right of, uh, of, of um, well, essentially indicative mineralogy and environmental testing for that matter. Um, and then on the bottom left-hand side, there's another example of um, SEM work to look at the way materials are caught in the environment. And then, having then got the sample on our, our said material, one can then do other analyses, such as in this case, um, it's um, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, in other words, element, the elemental analysis. But from the analysis of the elements, one can then look at the, prop, the, the distribution of those elements in the environment, where they've come from, where they're coming to, and therefore then in, in imply where the uh, sources and so on might, might, and sources and receptors might be. And this was around a, 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 a hazardous landfill site. Um, and then, which then leads on to the next logical area of work, which is to try to take those data and then measure it and then look at the way uh, it, 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 the, the dust propagates in the environment to then say how one could predict how dust might then travel in the, in the, in the, in the, in the local area. For example, again, from a, from a planning or design perspective. And there are, you see, there, there are software packages I'm sure you're familiar with where the, the propagation of uh, gaseous pollutants can be quite readily predicted, especially from point sources. It's a lot harder for particulate matter. And in particular, it's very hard or, or almost impossible to do that with coarse particulate matter on an area source. And that's an area that uh, we're working on as well. And then finally, the reason why, again, Ollie can't be here is because he's doing the stuff on the left-hand side. You know, we, 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 we often, although we didn't start off with testing for dust in the workplace, well, it's a logical extension, I suppose, that, 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 that we do that. And so therefore, that's, that's what we do and uh, um, go out and do personal monitoring and so on. We also do PM10 monitoring and we do site, site, site work like that, but which, is, which in other words has all um, led on. As we say here, uh, at the end, it's all really come from bits of sticky back plastic. We do like you know, like many 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 firms like us, we do we do consultancy work, environmental impact assessment, and so on. We do an amount of work overseas now, um, and indeed we then we, we look at um, our, where we're doing RCS testing and so on, um, working on best practice guidance. We we have got funding from the BG, well through the BGS uh, to look at PM 2.5 sampling and are involved in a couple of other research projects about the efficacy of vegetation for dust um, screening and so on. We're looking at dust on solar panels because that, again, can be an issue where with a, the, you know, the, there might be a, a, a conflict between a site and a, and a, and a solar farm, for example. Um, we're looking at seeing how the, the software can be used uh, on, and dis dis distributed better. Um, which, again, coming from, indeed, our sticky back plastic, which leads on to the spot prize. So, has anybody got any idea about what this stuff is? And, and you know, as I say, here, here it is. The, you know, there is an alternative to this, by the way. I either have a dust scan pen or some dust scan post-it notes. So, if, if anyone can really put some ideas as to what this stuff might be, it's a, uh, it's a, it, I can, I'll just get, while, you, while you're thinking about it, hopefully, I'll, I'll just let you know why it was an issue uh, and why we worked out what it was. We were doing some monitoring around a landfill site, and, um, and again, Dan will know about this because it comes from microscopy. A colleague found this on one of our samples and was perplexed to begin with, did a bit of an internet, internet research and identified what this material was. And consequently, we then started having a bit of a panic because it could have been that we were contaminating our own samples. And of course, that was a real 
big issue because clearly you don't want to be doing things like that. It turns out, and for reasons that are shown on this screen, why we were then able to demonstrate, no, we weren't contaminating our own samples. And, we're not con we, and we weren't able to, and uh, we, were, you know, we were able to demonstrate this and also to uh, support some information provided by, uh, by equipment suppliers who make statements regarding their products as to why you should use their product in particular ways. So, any ideas? Okay, right, it's printer toner. It's printer toner. And it, the reason why we knew it uh, wasn't our printer toner, and the reason why the manufacturers, the big brand manufacturers say use our product is because this is waste toner, and it's waste toner, uh, it, it conforms to a size fraction, it conforms to the color specifications, but the particles are, on the, the, they, 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 they will fit through a grid, but they're not of an even shape. That is generic toner. Posh toner, so as to speak, the particles are essentially beads. And so when we looked at our own toner, we found that it wasn't this, it was that uh, you know, the, 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 we were using a, a Canon printer at the time and it was, uh, we, we were able to say, show that we weren't contaminating our samples. Major area of relief. Second thing of this that was of, in, of interest though was that this then came, where was this coming from? The answer is, it, this, was tra this traveled about 400 meters from a landfill that was legitimately handling and disposing waste industrial toner. So it's perfectly legitimate for it to be there. It was blowing around. The point being, we found it on one of our samples, had a complete fit about it, thinking we had, you know, we were, we were, you know, causing a problem. Thankfully weren't, but instead were able to, um, you know, well, I'm, a, I'm able to bring a talking point. So, so thanks very much. So, Percy and I are going home again, sorry. And if anyone's got any questions, please ask. Stunned silence. You showed the, the various tools for, um, for the sticky tools. Yes. For attracting the dust. Yeah. You know the experiment you did on the farm? Yes. Did, did that actually demonstrate the, the effectiveness of those uh, the sticky, the sticky approach? Yes. In, and, uh, and is there any other approach that you might want to use to attract dust, like electrostatic or something like that? We, well, w yes. Um, we use sticky we use sticky back plastic because we always did. Without doubt, you could use different materials. But the reason the other reason why we do it is because it's cheap and cheerful. Now we did so we start I think that um, and Rob again you'd correct me on this. They the, the, the you, they were using um, the material that people cover school books with. It turns out that that's really good for environmental dust sampling. It sheds the water. But it doesn't. Uh, but it does, and it doesn't stick too many flies. But it has one limitation: you can't decouple it. When we started doing characterization work, we needed a new adhesive. So in fact, we then did a research project project to come up with us with a, with a similar glue, uh, which has more or less the same catch properties, but it can be decoupled. The answer is yes. Of course, you could be using different materials. We don't. Um, it's because, I mean, look, the, the samplers are, you know, hundreds of pounds, the, the samples are tens of pounds. Without doubt, though, if you were looking for a specific fraction, clearly you wouldn't use a tool like this. This is for, this is for environmental compliance monitoring. This is for screening. But for specific, uh, for specific targeted sampling, then you'd use a different device. Electrostatic, well, interestingly enough, in terms of electrostatics, I mean, plastics have attractive properties, so to speak. And in fact, one of the things we try to avoid is getting too much of that happen, because clearly we just want to catch the stuff that's blowing around, as opposed to saying it's sitting there. Because generally speaking, we, we collect the stuff that blows through the air, as opposed to is caught in, an, in, a, well, in a workplace, for example. But that doesn't mean to say it couldn't be done. And occasionally we do do that, but generally speaking, it's, it's about the material that's traveling through an air or dropping out of the sky. Okay, thank you.